In this lecture, I will provide an overview of human resource information systems and human resource analytics, which go by HRIS and HR Analytics respectively for short. So to get things started, I'll start with an overview of human resource information systems, and then I'll move on to an overview of HR analytics, and then move on to discussing the relationship between the human resource information system and HR analytics, and then we'll move on to the evolution of human resource information systems and HR analytics, and then finally finish up with the competency one might need to get into the fields and be successful in the fields of human resource information systems and HR analytics. So let's start with that overview of human resource information systems. So what is an HRIS? Well, a human resource information system can be defined as a system used to acquire, store, manipulate, analyze, retrieve, and distribute pertinent information about an organization's human resources. Now you might be find it interesting to know that this quote comes directly from an article published in 1990 by Tannenbaum in the Journal of Systems Management. And the reason I point out the date here and specifically the year is that this definition here has been quoted many times in the decades that have followed. And today this is still a very current definition for what a human resource information system is. So we're thinking about what a human resource information system is, we can really think about the confluence or the integration of two different areas. We have human resource management on one hand and then information technology or IT on the other hand. Now, of course, the, at the crux or the center of this are the data that reside in the system or that we hope to acquire to reside in the, in the system itself. So what is the goal of a human resource information system? Well, the goal primarily is to provide accurate and timely data. So both accurate and timely data. And when we have these two things, we typically think of the data as being high quality. Now, what about the importance of human resource information systems for an organization? Well, they provide comprehensive information in the form of integrated databases. They improve human resource operations and management processes. They facilitate user decision making. They shift the focus from transactional to trans transformational activities, which we'll explore in just a minute in more detail. And they help to deliver HR services more efficiently and accurately. So a moment ago, I referenced the terms transactional and transformational activities and how we've seen a shift from transactional to transformational activities within HR. So now I'd like to provide some more context about what I mean about that. So here on this graph, you can see on the y-axis, we have the percent of time spent on a particular type of activity. And on the x-axis, you see the two activity types that I mentioned, transactional and transformational. So transactional activities are those activities that are administrative in nature. They are necessary to be done, but they're not really gonna add additional value, but it's not good if you don't do them. So for example, a transactional activity would be payroll. So making sure people get paid on time. This isn't gonna add a lot of value to the organization if any, but if you don't pay people on time, you'll hear about it and employees might get frustrated or might even leave if this becomes a trend in the organization. Now, it could also include other compliance-oriented activities and things that the organization has to do in terms of reporting to the government, whether that's local, state, or national, or federal. Now, transformational activities, on the other hand, these are those, val those activities that the organization does and that specifically are done in HR that really add value to the organization. These are those activities that contribute to the strategic objectives and to the organization being able to sustain a competitive advantage by leveraging the people in its organization. Because after all, the HR area, the HR department, the function, it's all about helping the organization manage employees and maintain the relationships with those employees. So what we've saw historically was what this first graph depicts, is that we saw organizations spending a larger percent of their time doing those transactional activities, meaning that they really had to do a lot of these things by hand. 50, 60, 70 years or longer ago, you didn't have sophisticated computers that would allow us to automate processes easily like payroll and so forth. So organizations would have to have their people do those processes by hand. Now, what we've seen today is that we've actually seen a shift where more time is being spent on transformational activities, especially in HR. And this is because 
a lot of those activities that were transactional in nature that historically had to be done by a human being are now being automated by our HRIS um, and other forms of technology we have access to. So the example I like to think about is benefits. Now, it used to be during open enrollment that you'd have to sit down with a benefits specialist and have them fill out the forms and get you enrolled in whatever benefits you wanted to be enrolled in. Well, that's a very time consuming process. And truth be told, a lot of people knew what they wanted to enroll in and didn't need to sit down with another person. And so today when we have self-service benefits portals on websites, this allows individual employees to contribute their own data by filling out forms online. And only if they need help do they need to reach out to someone from HR if they have questions about certain healthcare plans or something like that. Now, what this means too is with more time being available to spend on transformational activities, this also means that this will require new skills and knowledge that weren't traditionally taught in universities for HR degrees or weren't used to develop existing HR employees as they came up in the field. And so this new space means that we need HR professionals that can think more strategically, can think more about how the HR department can contribute to the success of the organization or the business specifically. And this also means that we now have more time to think about opportunities to leverage data and HR analytics specifically. So how can we use data to inform the decisions that will help us make, our, make more transformational action in the organization? So now let's shift gears from the overview of human resource information systems to talking about HR analytics specifically and what it is. So you can think of HR analytics as being HR as a science. And so what I mean by that is that you have your human resources, of course, in HR. And then when you combine that with data informed decision making and bring those together, you get what we can refer to as HR analytics or human resource analytics. Now, a more formal definition for HR analytics is that HR analytics is the process of collecting, analyzing, and reporting people-related data for the purpose of improving decision-making, achieving strategic objectives, and sustaining a competitive advantage. Now, the term HR analytics is also related to other terms you might be familiar with, such as people analytics, human capital analytics, talent analytics, and workforce analytics. Sometimes these terms are used interchangeably with one another, but some people will contend that different, these different terms have different scope in terms of how broad they are. Some would argue, for instance, that people analytics is broader than HR analytics and involves any people data residing in the organization or connected to the organization in some way. And But regardless, if you mention these terms, people will know more or less what you're talking about. But it's often good to know what the other common terms that are used in addition to HR analytics, just so you make sure you're on the same page with someone you're speaking with. Now, I think it's really helpful to think of HR analytics in what I refer to as the HR analytics project life cycle. And that means to consider HR analytics from the point of view of completing a project involving HR analytics. And so what I see are the following phases here, question formulation, data acquisition, data management, data analysis, data interpretation, and storytelling, and deployment and implementation. So let's dive into each one of these in a little bit more detail here. So we talk about question formulation, we're really talking about defining business relevant and strategy guided problems and questions that can be solved and answered using data that we already have or data that we potentially need to acquire, which brings me to the next phase, which is data acquisition. So in terms of data acquisition, this refers to collecting new data, retrieving existing data in some way, or gathering and sourcing high quality data of some sort. Now our goal here is to acquire good data from the outside, and that means data that is relatively free or mostly free of bias, data that are accurate, and data that are timely as well. Now, after we've acquired the data for a project, we can move on to data management. And data management is often an extensive part of the human analy HR analytics project lifecycle in terms of the time spent on this particular phase. In fact, some people would say there's an 80-20 rule, which is that you spend 80% of your time managing your data and only 20% of your time analyzing the data. I would argue it's often more in my experience, like a 95-5 split, you spend 95% of your time managing your data, and only about 5% of your time analyzing, interpreting, and telling a story about those data. So in the data management phase, this is where we're wrangling, cleaning, manipulating, joining, and structuring our data. 
And again, this can be a very cumbersome and time consuming process, even for data that we think are gonna be relatively simple and straightforward. Now the next phase is the data analysis phase, which is most of what people think of when they think of HR analytics. Now data analysis is the phase where we're going to apply quantitative and or qualitative methods to data to identify associations, trends, differences, changes, or categories, as well as to predict the likelihood of future events or outcomes. And this includes applying tools like mathematics, statistics, machine learning, simulations, and even computational modeling. Now, the next phase after data analysis is once we've analyzed the data, it's time for data interpretation and storytelling. And so this means we need to make sense of the data, analyst, uh, data analysis findings and evaluate problems and questions using those data that we've analyzed. And this means that we're hearkening back to that question formulation phase at the very beginning where we defined a problem and or formulated a question. It's good to interpret your data with that problem in mind and that question in mind as well. And that way you can make sure that whatever solution or answer you come up with is really going to be um, is going to be informed by the data itself. Now, this is also the phase where we're going to be communicating, hopefully, an accurate yet compelling story to key stakeholders, and that's that storytelling component. Storytelling has been receiving a lot more attention these days when it comes to working with data and reporting out data because data analysis and data analytics aren't much good if you can't affect real change in organization and society more broadly. And so telling an accurate yet compelling story becomes really, really important. So it's good to be on top of and understand key and relevant storytelling principles that might help you tell that better narrative and construct a better narrative about what you found. Now, the final phase here is the deployment and implementation phase. And this is really all about prescribing action based on the interpretation of data analytic findings and or designing a data-informed intervention of some kind within the organization. And so this is really about prescription. This is about taking what we've learned from our data analysis, everything we've done previously in this HR analytics project lifecycle, and then making real change in the organization. This is where that transformational activity comes to life in an, organiza in, in, um, an organization when we were thinking about those HR activities uh, previously. Whether we're referring to transactional or transformational, here we're referring to those transformational activities. We're trying to change something about the organization, and this change should be aligned with the organization's strategic objectives, its business objectives, and it should be generally geared towards helping the organization achieve a competitive advantage as well. Now, you'll notice this is a life cycle here for this project. And so what that means is that often once we start deploying something and implementing something, it's going to raise new questions, new problems. And so this can start a new cycle or the same cycle over with some adapta adaptations or changes. Now, let's talk about the current state of HR analytics. And the reason I want to bring this up is that there really is a need for people who have HR analytics knowledge and skills, who know how to actually work with the data, as well as how to interpret and tell a story and make sense of the data so that you can make better data-informed decisions as opposed to just relying solely on your intuition or the way things have been done traditionally in the organization. Well, what I'm about to report is from a 2018 Deloitte Global Human Capital Trends Report, and they found several things, and I'll highlight three of the things right now. The first big finding in my mind was that they found that 85% of the surveyed companies rated HR analytics as either important or very important. So the vast majority of the companies that they surveyed for this report indicated that HR analytics was important or very important for their organization's success. Now, 70% of those surveyed companies indicated that they were actively working towards integrating HR analytics into their key decision-making and strategic decision-making. However, only 42% or less than half of those surveyed companies rated themselves as ready or very ready for the HR analytics trend. Why is this? Well, one big explanation for this is that they don't know what HR analytics is, they know the term, and they don't have the people who can help them bring HR analytics to life. So there's a need for training in HR analytics, and there's a need both at the university level as well as on-the-job training and op opportunities for people who are already working in HR. 
Now let's focus on that relationship between the HRIS and HR Analytics. Now, by definition, both HRIS and HR Analytics have a lot of commonalities. After all, they're both working with people data or HR data. Now, here I've represented HRIS and HR Analytics as two separate circles, and their overlap creates a Venn diagram here. And so we'll start by thinking about the flow of data from one to the other, and giving some examples of how that might establish or exemplify the type of relationship these two functions or teams within an organization might have. So on the one hand, you could have a situation where data from the HRIS flow to the HR analytics team. So in other words, you could think of a situation in which data residing in the HRIS could be used by HR analysts to solve problems, answer questions, and inform decision making. So this could be a situation where turnover data and other data about perhaps selection, recruitment, and so forth could be pulled together from the HR information system and analyzed by the HR analytics team. Now you could have a situation too where the data flow the other way and the relationship flows in this direction, which is from HR analytics team to the HRIS team. And this might take the form of data being acquired and tools developed by HR analysts, analysts could be incorporated into the HRIS. So what might have started as an ad hoc project by the HR analytics team to solve what they thought was a one-off problem might de be developed into a tool or some type of program or platform of some kind that then could be integrated into the HR information system or at least the data from it could be integrated into that HR information system. Now, both functions often share overlapping responsibilities, and in some organizations, they may even operate as a unified function, or one might be nested in the other. So, for example, some companies might have already have had established HRIS teams, and so when they became more interested in building in more capability with respect to HR analytics, they might have just built that into their existing HRIS team by hiring HR analysts. Now, in other organizations, the HRIS team may be nested within the information technology function or IT for short, and HR analytics could be nested within a center of excellence. So I've noticed more organizations today seem to be taking this approach. I shouldn't say more, but a number of organizations rather seem to be taking an approach where they create a center of excellence for data science and or data analy analytics, whereby that is at the hub, and then they have different spokes whereby those data analysts and those data scientists can consult with different functional areas of the business, like of course, HR, operations, finance, and so forth and so on. And so this allows for there to be those people that have a high degree of speciality in data analytics and data science to then work with people that have that functional or domain expertise in these other areas of the business to try to solve problems, answer questions, and in general provide that data informed decision making. Now the degree of integration between the HRIS and HR analytics functions can vary across organizations as I've been mentioning. Now in some organizations, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend this approach, there might be a relatively big amount, there might be a large disjoint between the HRIS team and the HR analytics team. In other words, they're more or less disconnected from each other or have very little functional overlap. Now, this can be a shortcoming because presumably there are data in the HRIS that would be beneficial for the HR analytics team to work with and to inform. And conversely, the HR analytics team might be able to um, improve some of the data that are being collected and stored in the HR information system itself, and they might be able to help the HRIS team with some of its analysis and reporting as well. Now, other organizations might have a higher degree of overlap between these two functions, and you can imagine a situation, as I mentioned before, where these two functions are completely integrated and unified in nature. So in terms of the evolution of HRIS and HR analytics, let's now parse apart some of the, the ways in which HR analytics and HRS are old and some of the ways that they are very new. So let's start with old first. Now, as concepts, practices, and systems, both HRIS and HR analytics have been around for decades. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the US military and uh, specifically the US Army 
has been using data that we would consider to be HR data or personnel data since around the time of World War II. Now, what they did is, with the help of industrial organizational psychologists around that time, they developed the what is called the U.S. Army and the U.S. Army Alpha and Beta Mental Ability Test, where the Alpha test was a written test for people that could actually um, that could could read and were literate, and the Beta test was for people that did not have strong reading abilities at that time or reading skills. Now, this was used for place selection and placement of people who were enlisted in the military and then placing them into the appropriate area based on their mental their scores on these mental ability tests. So that's an early example of HR analytics being around for quite a long time. Now, another old example of HR, in this case, HRS, was the automation of payroll data by companies like ADP over 50 or 60 years ago. With some of the first mainframe computers, this was one of the first places in HR where we started to see some form of automation. And so payroll was one of the first things to be automated. And so this would be, it's a, a very contemporary idea and been something we're able to do much better these days, but it is something that was first done decades ago. Now, another thing that was happening decades ago was the digitalization of employee data and records. And this started happening around the same time in which companies started gaining access, especially larger companies, to mainframe computers and where they could actually store some of this information. Now, let's shift gears and talk about the ways in which some of the new things that HR analytics and HRS are doing today that have really built off of these old practices, systems, and concepts. So recent advances in technology and data capabilities have provided a foundation for new opportunities to leverage data to inform decision-making and action. So this includes improvements in computational speed and storage capacity with modern day computers. This also includes advancements in machine learning and artificial intelligence. A lot of these things and concepts related to machine learning and artificial intelligence have, the ideas have been around for some time, but it's been only relatively recently that we're able to implement these things and that they can enjoy wide, wider spread use in organizations today for decision-making purposes. Now, also something that is new is that more HR team members are beginning to gain the data science and data analytics knowledge and skills necessary to have an effective HRS and or HR analytics function. And so this has been a big change within HR specifically as traditionally it was HR would bring in someone from the outside, such as an industrial organizational psychologist, and HR departments are still doing this today, especially with some more sophisticated types of uh, data analytic work. They might bring in other people, such as people with advanced degrees in statisticians, ma in statistics, mathematics, uh, computer science, and other areas of that nature. So what we've also seen too, in terms of more recent trends, is that when we look over time, we've seen this inflection point starting to form. And we're well on our way now in terms of the acceleration of technology and data cap capabilities as they impact HR and other functional areas of the business. And so as you can see on the y-axis here, we have technology and data cap capabilities. And then on the x-axis, we have time. And so what we're seeing is increasing number of platforms, programs, language and so forth, languages and so forth that have allowed us to accelerate the ways that we actually work with data, make sense of data and use data to glean insights and to make real change in organizations. And so this includes historical players like IBM and SAP, as well as newer platforms like Alteryx, Power BI, Tableau, and then also programming languages that are becoming very popular as well and have in, been enjoying wider spread use, which include Python and R to just name a few. Now, with all that being said, and with this acceleration of technology and our data capa capabilities, it's always, remembered to, it's always important to remember to reflect on the limits of technology in general and of specific types of technology. Now, technology solutions and sophisticated modeling and algorithms can, with the emphasis on can here, create new opportunities for human resource management to leverage data to inform decision making and, and action. However, acquiring and using low quality, which would mean inaccurate, stale or old or biased data, will lead to problems which include but are not limit, include which are not limited to poor interpretations and decisions based on those data when we have low quality data, 
bad recommendations when we have low quality data, a loss of credibility for HR when we recommend something that's based off of low quality data, or when someone is not trained to use the technology properly, they run an analysis without understanding what assumptions go into it, and they make inappropriate conclusions based off of the analysis, which again can harm the credibility of HR and specifically a burgeoning area like HR analytics. Now, it can also, in very bad situations, low quality data and specifically biased data can lead to discriminatory practices. And some of these will be in the form of disparate impact, where on the face of it, it may not look discriminatory, but the algorithm that's being used might have the effect of disenfranchising or adversely affecting different protected groups, whether that be referring to race, gender, or uh, religion, or any other protected group that one might consider in the United States or more broadly in other countries. Now, another thing to be aware of, and this very much relates to data quality, is of the phenomenon that many people refer to as garbage in, garbage out. And we really want to beware of garbage in, garbage out, because when we have low quality garbage data, in other words, and we run it through technology and, and some type of analysis for, analysis, for example, or a model or an algorithm, we're just going to get garbage findings and interpretations. In other words, we put garbage into the tool, we're gonna get garbage out of the tool. Our tools, whether it's a programming language like R or Python or a platform or enterprise resource planning platform created by SAP or uh, IBM, for example, these are not going to be a panacea or cure-all. They won't cure bad data. So we need to take care to make sure that we get good data to begin with before we even apply the data to our technology and analytical capabilities. Now, another thing that I cannot emphasize enough is that with the rapid growth of technology and technology becoming more accessible to more people, it means that more people now have more power to do things that could have big ramifications or consequences. And so this is why more than ever, we need ethical decision making. And really what I like to remind people of is just because you can, should you. Just because you're able to analyze something, build a model, build an algorithm, should you be doing that. Just because you can collect that data from your employees or scrape that data from their social media feeds, should you do that. So really stepping back and asking this question can be a good way to pump the brakes and think more thoughtfully and carefully about what type of decision you're about to make and what the implications are for different stakeholders. Now, of course, there's more rigorous frameworks we can apply here, and, it, and there's other ethical decision-making frameworks that I would recommend looking into. There's one by um, Santa Clara University and their, their Department of Ethics that's really quite wonderful. It's really available on their website. So if you Google Santa Clara University and ethics or ethical decision-making framework, you should be able to find it that way. Let's finish up talking about the human competencies that are needed to be effective in the areas of human resource information systems and human resource analytics. So I really view this as the blending of knowledge and skills from two broad domains. The first domain is HR expertise, which shouldn't be too surprising. To be effective in HRS or HR analytics, you need to understand HR systems, policies, procedures, and practices, as well as how HR fits into the broader business environment and how HR can contribute to the success of the business and to attaining strategic objectives. After all, it is HR that helps to manage the human capital and hopefully align human behavior in the organization with the goals of that organization. Now, the other domain that we need to blend HR expertise with is data literacy. And data literacy is really made up of several sub-competencies that are relevant here. The first competency is really, and not surprisingly, knowledge and skills related to math and statistics, as well as how to work with data. Another competency that's really relevant here with data literacy is data management and data visualization. The third competency I'll mention that's very important with data literacy and sometimes doesn't get mentioned is knowledge and skill related to critical evaluation, critical thinking, and logical thinking as well. It's really important to have that third competency when you're analyzing data, you're applying math or statistics, and you're managing that data and even visualizing it. So, 
Blending these two areas together can make an effective person in either HRIS or HR analytics. And when we think about expertise and data literacy, I think it's helpful to think about it in terms of a continuum. We can always be building skills when it comes to data literacy, whether that be in math, statistics, working with data, visualizing data, or just critical thinking and logic surrounding working with data. So if we think about the data literacy continuum, we can frame it like this. On the one end, we have people who you might consider to be zero quants, people with very little low levels of data literacy, very few quantitative skills, in other words, and these are people that probably have no formal training or very little formal training in statistics, math, computer science, and areas like that. Further along the continuum, we have people that can be considered light quants. And then even further after that, on the other extreme of the continuum, we have people that can be referred to as heavy quants. And people who are on the far end of the continuum that are heavy quants, these are the people who tend to have advanced degrees in statistics, mathematics, computer science, or data science, or another related quantitative field. These are people that tend to do a lot of the heavy lifting in organizations that are doing anything with artificial intelligence, machine learning, and more sophisticated programming as it relates to working with data. Now, people in the middle though, the light quants, if you will, are the people that are part of this emerging sweet spot for organizations as these people can act as analytical translators. A person who's in the middle of this continuum doesn't have all the skills of a heavy quant, but they know a lot more than someone who's a zero quant. They understand basic principles and techniques and tools related to math, statistics, data analytics in general, and they understand how to ask questions that can be answered using data or to define problems that can be solved using data. And so that's a really important spot in organizations because these are people that can help take what the heavy quants are producing and disseminate or translate it out to people in the rest of the organization. And they can also talk to those people who are on the ground that maybe they themselves don't have much training or any training in the area of um, statistics, math, or computer science. But these light quants can help to translate the problems that they're facing in their day-to-day -day work or the questions that they need answered into something that the organization can actually contribute to by solving that problem or answering that question using data that maybe the light quant can collect and analyze themselves or pass it off if it's more advanced to those people who would be considered heavy quants. So, now let's talk about the core competencies for HR analytics specifically. So thus far, up until this point, I've been referring to competencies that are necessary for both HRIS and HR analytics success. Now we're diving and narrowing down to HR analytics. So there's really seven core competencies that I see as being necessary for effectiveness in HR analytics. And the first one is theory. And that is theory related to human beings, human behavior, cognition, and affect or feeling. And so this could be theory from human resource management, from sociology, from psychology, from anthropology, and from other social science areas. We need to have a framework for thinking about and understanding how people operate, think, and behave. Now, the second competency is business. People need to be competent in the business, or in other words, have business acumen. They especially need to know how the business in general works and how HR fits into and contributes to that business. The next competency is data management. Of course, you need to be able to work with data and manipulate data and store data. We saw this already with that HR Analytics Project lifecycle earlier in the lecture. And we need people that understand how to measure things. Human beings are tricky to measure. There's a whole field called psychometrics, which has to do with measuring human beings, developing personality inventories, monitoring performance, evaluating performance, and making sure that we're developing tools that are both reliable and valid. Also, we need competence, of course, in statistics and data analysis, and this relates very much to data literacy, as does the data management area and measurement area as well. And increasingly, we're getting more attention paid to the importance of having people that are competent in storytelling. They can tell that compelling and accurate story based on the data that can help people understand what was done and well as understand what needs to change going forward and what type of intervention can be made based on the inferences derived and the insights gleaned from those data. And then the final of the seven core competencies for HR analysts is knowledge and expertise related to ethics and employment law. 
As I mentioned earlier, ethic, ethical decision-making is really key for HR analytics, especially with the explosion and acceleration of technology and our data capabilities. We need to think carefully about just because we can, should we? Also, in HR, we need to think about prevailing employment laws, whether they be at the local, state, federal, or in some cases, things that might be broader than that even. And we need to think about what is it that we need to abide by and comply with within the HR area. Now, it would be perhaps unrealistic for a single person to be highly competent in each of these competency areas. And so this is why HR analytics is often best carried out with a team of people who can distribute this expertise across these competencies. Now, when it comes to developing an HR analytics team, there's really some considerations that you need to take, which are whether you train existing people, whether these are internal to your organization or external hires, or if you bring people in external from the organization or who are internal that already have some expertise and capabilities in the area of HR analytics. Now, one other approach that I've mentioned before is this idea of building a center of excellence. And this would typically involve hiring more people with general expertise, but deep expertise in data science, statistics, math, and data analytics and having them consult with other areas of the business. And so that could be another way to cover some of the competencies in your HR department when it comes to HR analytics is collaborating with a center of excellence within your organization should that exist. So in this lecture, I focused first on the overview of what HRIS is, then I moved on to that overview of HR analytics, and then we talked about that relationship between HRIS and HR analytics and how that can vary within different organizations. We then moved on to the evolution of HRIS and HR analytics from a historical perspective and really concluded that they're both old and new. And then finally, we wrapped things up just a moment ago talking about competencies that are needed to be effective in HRIS and HR analytics and did a deeper dive into seven competencies that are, that are good to have when you want an effective HR analytics team within an organization. These are references for the citations that I, and for the, the sources that I cited throughout the presentation and the lecture today. And this wraps up the lecture, which was an overview of HRIS and HR analytics.